manger laid, sent to earth since price to pay, he's my Savior, he's my Savior, see him stand in Pilate's hall, see him take the blame for all, my Savior, He's my Savior, He's my Savior, because He left His throne for me, He's my Savior, because He died in agony, He's my Savior. Let's stand together this morning for the reading of the Scripture, Romans chapter 11, Romans chapter number 11. We'll read from verses, we'll start verse 33, we'll read the end of the chapter, and then we'll read the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. So we'll start 11 and verse number 33, and I appreciate you being here this morning and being faithful to church and starting your week out in church. No better way to start start um, to start your week than in church. And so thank you for being here. Romans chapter 11 and verse 33. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And let's pray. Father, we so, we, Father, we're so grateful for your word. 
We're so grateful for the opportunity we have to get here, Lord. And we've had a great morning in Sunday school, the singing and all that we've done. But Father, I pray as we look into your word this morning that you'd help us to, to get something that would help us in our lives, that would be an encouragement to us and help us to live the way you would want us to live on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Of course, we've been talking about Explore the Book, going along with our, our theme for 2016. And I hope if, you're, if you've been newer and you've been getting into the Bible, I hope you're enjoying it, and I hope you're getting something out of it. Um, the Bible is a tremendous, tremendous book, and we've given you many different um, uh, many different challenges with that, and we're grateful for it. Um, but the Bible is a rock solid, steady place to put our trust for this life, and of course, in the in the next life that is to come. Uh, the Bible is a is a tremendous tool that many Christians do not take uh, really take advantage of in their life. On Sunday nights. We've been talking about joy. I encourage you, if you're not coming, to come. We've been talking in the book of Philippians. It talks much about how to have the joy of the Lord in our life in, in many different areas. But really, if we're going to have the joy in our life that God wants us to have, the Bible is really the key to it in understanding the Bible. Charles Spurgeon said, There is nothing in the law of God that will rob you of happiness. It only denies you that which costs you sorrow. It's just so funny how we try to flip that, don't we? You know, well, if I, if I live for God, I'm being obedient, but I just, I won't be joyful. No, the opposite is actually true. The joy we find in delight, the joy we will find in life comes from delighting in God through His Word. You can never get into His Word enough. You can never delight in His Word enough. Think of it as a, as a, 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 a young lady who has a, a boyfriend or maybe even a young husband who, is, who has been called in the military and he's living on the other side of the world and, and regularly he sends letters to her and, and well, obviously they'd have to be dating because once they're married, this wouldn't happen. But uh, <clears throat> they get these, she gets these letters and, and she reads the letter from her, from her love, of, the love of her life and she'll read it and reread it. No one would come to her and say, listen, why are you delighting in his letters and why don't you delight in him? Because what he is saying and writing to her is an extension of his love for her. And what God has written in his word for us is an extension of his love for us. And so we need to get in God's word. Now as we look in the verses we read today, we're going to focus in chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2. He makes some comments about God's wisdom and the depth of God's, love, God's wisdom and judgments in that and then as he gets to the end of it, he says, because of all that, there's something we need to do. Paul is so convinced <clears throat> that living as a Christian, really a sold-out Christian, is so important, he's begging us to make sure that we do it. The word beseech means I beg you. He tells us what we should do, and then he tells us how we are to do it. Excuse me. When we completely sell out to God and we choose to follow Him, we are choosing, and will you hear us say this, to follow His will for our lives. Now we use that term, God's will. Say, so what is that? That means we're choosing to let God direct our life in every aspect. That is God's will. You see, God has something very specific he wants for each and every one of us. That's his will. And so when we sell out to God, when I remember when I made that decision, after being a Christian for a couple of years and not really living for God and getting in a mess of trouble, I came to a point in my life like, you know what, I'm going to take this seriously. I am going to follow God. And so I started following him, and I started following, as it were, his will, doing what he wants for me. How do we figure that out? Well, it's primarily through his word. Now, there's specifics outside of his word, you know, where God's going to have you live, what he's going to have, have you do in your life. 
that, that God leads us and guides us. But, but the bulk of what God wants us to do in our life, His will for our life, is found in His Word. God's will is another way of saying, that is what God wants me to do. If I asked my son, Jack saying, saying up here, my son Jack, if I said, Jack, I want you to take out the trash, 50% of the time he's going to say, it's Josiah's day. <laughs> <clears throat> You know, it's, all, it's always like you have to fit. Who's to, whose day is it to take out the trash? Never my day, by the way. Let me just say that. So I'm like, let's just do odd and even. I think Josiah was a dumb one. He goes, I'll take odd. I'm like, brother, do you know that some months have 31 days? But anyhow, God bless them. <clears throat> but if I say, Josiah it, or Jack, it's your turn to take the, tra- it, I take the trash out. He doesn't have to say, I wonder what dad wants me to do. He doesn't have to wonder that. I just told you, take the trash out. That is my will for your life, okay? Now, getting him to do it's another thing. God has a will for all of us. Primarily, his will is found through his word. We ought to want to do what God wants us to do. That is called obedience. That is why God created us. And that is what will bring the most joy in our life. See? I never knew what joy was. Until I started following God's word. You know? Now, some people say, I never knew what real joy was until I got married. That's okay, too. But then he said, by then it was too late. So I don't know about that. But listen, that's where joy comes from, saying, this is what God wants for me. I'm going to follow his path for my life. God's will is found primarily in his word. But I want us to look at that this morning in the brief time that we have. Now, as we look at Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, I think we'll understand it a little bit better if we, if we look at it backwards. Let's dissect the verses, but let's start from the end, and then we'll dissect it and figure out how he wants to get to the end. What do I mean? Number one, let me give you three things. Number one, God wants us to prove his will in our life. Now look at the end of verse 12. Told you we're going to go backwards. He says in the end of verse 12, <clears throat> that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect word, will of God. See, God wants us to prove his will in our life. Now what does that mean? The word prove means to recognize as genuine after examination. To approve it. In other words, God wants us to see his will for our life is that which is approved, which is genuine, really, which is best for us. God wants us to see that what he wants for our life is the best. It's genuine. It is the real deal. Now, the point it then would say, if following his will is the genuine, then that means there is a will for my life that would not be genuine. If something is genuine, there seems to always be something that competes against it that is false. How many people get caught up in the false? We kind of want to do our own thing and figure out what we think is best for us. And really, behind it all is our spiritual enemy, and we follow that way, and that way is not best for us. It's like Pinocchio. I've never really, the kids have watched it when they were younger, and and I've never watched it all the way through, but I think he got messed up. I think he was promised if you go to this island, everything's going to be honky-dory, and you're going to enjoy everything, and it's going to be great. And I think he turned into a donkey. By the way, I know some people I think that are kind of like Pinocchio. Sometimes it's me. But we, he, we think this is the best path. This is where joy is found. This is where it's going to be. We get down that path and we realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. It's not. God's path is always the best path. It is genuine. Why is the false path so bad? Because of who's behind it. John 10.10 10 tells us, The thief cometh not, speaking of Satan, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That doesn't sound good. That sounds bad. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Don't settle for second best. 
Now, what did he say about this will of God that we're supposed to prove, that we're supposed to see that's genuine? He says three things. He says, what is that good? It's good. It's excellent. It's joyful. We have to prove and take that which is best. Last Sunday night in Philippians, when we were looking at joy, we saw in verse 10 of Philippians 1, he says that you may approve things that are excellent. He's saying the same thing. He's saying, listen, don't settle for something that's not excellent. Make sure you get the best. Make sure you settle for something that is best for you. See, most of us have the wrong uh, uh, belief about God's will in our life. And by the way, I believed it too. As an as a, as a, uh, as a, as a unspiritual Christian, I'd walk into church and I'd see the church people. And I'm like, I don't want to have anything to do with it. That's not how I'm living my life. Because I looked at that life and I thought, that is going to be boring. That is not going to bring joy. Doing what I want to do is going to bring joy. And then I come to realize I'm not happy. I don't have joy. As I got into church and started serving the Lord, I found out that that's bringing me joy. It was good. The only thing you lose out on is that which is not best, which is not excellent. By the way, when you start seeing something that's excellent and you start getting involved with it, you start saying, that which I thought was good isn't as good as I thought it was. Uh, last Saturday, uh, there was a new hamburger place that opened in, in Signal Hill. And I was at the house doing, some, doing, a, doing a little personal work at the house. And Allison came over, and I don't think anybody else was there. And it's like, hey, let's go to that new hamburger place in Signal Hill. So Allison and I took off. Uh, GD Bros over here on um, Willow. And man, now it's expensive. I ain't going back very often. But I got, I got a hamburger. By the way, this hamburger had gravy on it. Mm. They had all these different weird burgers. Don't, don't give me that look, Brother Mahan. It wasn't like a fake gravy. It had some kind of spice in it. And I'm telling you, it was from heaven, Brother Pineda. It, it was a hamburger, Brother. In fact, I'm, we're going there when we're done here. It, it had a hamburger, and it had sh barbecue short rib, and it had gravy, and it had a bun that was from heaven. I had a religious experience. Allison ate something else with coleslaw. I don't know what that was all about. But we're sitting there, I'm like, this is good. Can I just tell you something? After I ate that hamburger, Brother Bacharo, I didn't say, you know what I want for dinner? I want to go to McDonald's. <laughs> because McDonald's isn't food. We've already established that. Listen, when you eat something like that, McDonald's is horse meat. Man, when you have something that's better, you say, how did I ever eat that garbage in the first place? Man, when, it, when you start serving the Lord and you follow him and it's like, how in the world did I believe that that over there was better? It's not. God's will is good. He also says it's acceptable. What is that good and acceptable? Acceptable means fully agreeable and well-pleasing. Whenever we're living according to God's plan, you know what? It's going to be well-pleasing. Not just to us, it's well-pleasing to God. And you know what? We're living in agreement with God because this is God saying, here's how I want you to live. And we're like, I'm going to live that way. Now we're living in harmony together. We're living in agreement, and it's well-pleasing. It's an ironic twist that when we live our life to be well-pleasing to God in full agreement with his will, we find that our life is well-pleasing to us. And I don't mean that in a selfish way. I'm just meaning like, listen, serving God is the best thing you can do. Living for God is the best thing you can do. It's acceptable. And then he said, it's perfect. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Where perfect means complete. You want to have a life of full meaning? Live for God. You want to have a life that you look at and say, man, my life is complete. Follow God's word. Let God's word dictate how you live, and you will have a complete life. Now, I'm not a New England Patriots fan. I think my son-in-law already knows that, but we still get along because he gave me a grandson, so we're good. But, but he likes the Patriots. I was reading something many years ago. Tom Brady, who's their quarterback, the, he, he, this is when he, he had won three Super Bowls by the time he was 28. 
So we would look at him as a football player and say, wow, he's accomplished everything he's ever wanted to accomplish. In 2005, he was interviewed on 60 Minutes, and he made this statement. Sometimes I wonder, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there is something greater out there for me? I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this isn't, this can't be what it's cracked up to be. The interview, interviewer asked him and said, so what's the answer to it? And he said, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. There's nothing to it. He got to the pinnacle of his career. Probably one of the best, I hate to admit it because my son-in-law's in here. And I don't want to hear it from him. Probably one of the best quarterbacks that's ever played the game. What do you mean, yep? <laughs> Have you been hanging with Ryan? Sorry about that. But can I just tell you something? He could be at the pinnacle. I think he dated, he married a supermodel. He's got more money than he'll ever spend. And he says, there's got to be something more. Man, I wish I knew what it was. You know what that is? Let me just explain it to you. That's an incomplete life. You know where that complete life is found? It's found in following God's will. It's found in following the Lord. So we're supposed to prove his will in our life. Number two... We're going backwards. If we are to prove his will, then we must change our ways. Go back to the beginning of verse 2 before he tells us about his will. He says, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, God's will, following God's will, will make a remarkable difference in our lives. But if it's going to make a difference in our lives, we've got to follow his plan. You see, if you want a specific product, you have to follow a specific process. If you're making a specific item, whether it's a cake or whatever, you need a specific amount of ingredients, certain types of ingredients, and it all has to come together to make the cake the way you want it to be. And if you don't have all those ingredients, you haven't followed the process, it is not going to work. Well, he says there's a process if we're going to go along this path. There is uh, two ways we change our ways. There's a, I don't call it negative, but the world, you know, the, we, we look at it as a negative. Well, let's just call it for that. There's a negative and a positive. The negative is don't be conformed to this world. Says That's what he said, and be not conformed to the world. The world is the way of thinking, a way of living that is apart from God, that will lead us to actions that are not biblical. If we are conformed to the world, just like everybody else, just like society lives, just like society believes, we will not live the way God wants us to be. That's why everybody is the same. You know, I saw a little, uh, a little uh, it, was a, it was a motivational poster, and it was a joke. It said, uniqueness. And it said, you are different. Just like everybody else. Everybody wants to be different, right? That first person that decided to dye their hair pink. I remember when I was in high school, and I was not a Christian in high school. I was a, th I was a, I was a, I was a bad kid. You didn't want your kids hanging around me. And, and, and it was like some girl, the, the first time, some girl came with pink hair, and another had some off-the-wall color hair, and we're like, man, that is weird. But it wasn't long before everybody was doing it. I want to be different, just like you. See, the conf conform means pressed into a mold. Everybody wants to be different, so you know what happens? We follow the way uh, that's, that's not scriptural, not biblical, and we end up all being just like everybody else. We're just, don't rock the boat, okay? Just do what everybody else does. Some people call that following the herd, Right? We just all follow. Why are you going that way? I have no idea. Everybody else is going that way. Okay. Over Christmas, we went to, um, we went to, uh, got some tickets. We went to Disneyland. And so we got there, and we picked probably the worst day ever to go. But it's like, well, we're off, you know. And I think everybody and their brother was there. So we got there, and they had all these long lines to get in. This is just to, just to scan your ticket and get in. So we get to the back of the line, and it's like the front of the line is a different zip code. And, and my wife's like, wait here. And there was like 50 different lines. And there was one line no one, went in, no one got in. 
We just all followed the herd. Oh, you know, we were chewing the cut. We're all in this long line, and the one line up in the front, no one noticed it was another line, so no one got in. And my wife's like, she calls. She had to call because I think I got roaming charges. She was so far away. But she's like, come on up here to the left. There's a line that's, and we went up there. There's no line. We got right in. We were still chewing the cud, but we all got in, okay? But you know what we do sometimes? We all just follow the herd. Well, I don't want to rock the boat. Everybody's doing it. Listen, let's not be conformed to what just everybody else does. By the way, if you want to be conformed, the Bible tells us we should be conformed to the image of Christ. Follow him. So let's not just be like everybody else. So that's the negative. The positive is do be transformed by the word. He says, don't be conformed. Don't be pressed into the world's mode, mold. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation is a, it means metamorphosis. It's, 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 it's a change on the inside that changes me on the outside. Think of a beautiful, I'm not, I'm not into butterfly, but a beautiful butterfly. They're, 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 they're a hairy little caterpillar, and they make a cocoon. They get into the cocoon, and they're, transformed into a beautiful butterfly. By the way, everything that that caterpillar had to be a butterfly was already inside of it. The cocoon process is where it comes out. That's what happens as a Christian. We need to be transformed in our mind. You see, whatever we put in our mind changes us, and it comes out in our actions. That's what we are to do. We must change our way of thinking. Why? Our way of thinking naturally, your way of thinking, my way of thinking is naturally fleshly. It's naturally going to head towards the wrong path. And what happens? Proverbs tells us there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Listen, when we follow our own path, we think this is the way to go. This will bring me the life. And we get to the end, it's like, this is the wrong place to be. We must be very careful about that. He says, be transformed, change your mind. A verse we looked at on Thursday night, Job chapter 31. He said, I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Now think about that for a minute. Now Job's talking about lust here. He said, I made an agreement with my eyes. So logically, the next thing should be, why should I look upon a maid? It's not what he said, Brother Pineda. He said, why should I think? Why? Because what we see in our eyes, we allow into our mind, gets there, and we start thinking about it. And the point he's making is, if I lay it in my mind and I think about it, the next thing is, I'm going to act upon it. Listen, if we allow garbage in our mind, garbage is going to come out in our life. It's going to happen. You cannot control how what you allow in your mind affects your life. You can't. You can only control what you allow in your mind. You say, I want to be different. you got to change your mind. You know what the great mind changer is? God's Word. Kind of hard to do something ridiculous when you got God's Word kind of floating around in there, right? If I'm thinking about what God said, I'm, I'm at church and I, I just heard something and something goofy comes up, God brings that, that spirit, that, that, remember that Bible verse you read? Remember that thing you heard and you're like, you're right, that's garbage. I got to be very careful. That's what he's telling us. So we saw, to recap, God wants us to prove his will. We do that by changing our ways. But what's the starting point? We're going backwards, right? Verse 1. If we are, number three, if we're going to change our ways, then we must present ourselves. That's where it all begins. Verse 1. He says, I beseech you, I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Man, Paul's pulling out all stops. I want you to get it. I want you to listen. I want you to do this. He says that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Listen, you're not going forward anywhere unless we present ourselves to the Lord. If you get saved, you're a new creature in Christ and God wants to change you. But Brother Pachardo, he is not going to do it against your will. Brother Pachardo gets saved and he says, yeah, I'm saved, but I don't want God to do anything in my life. Can I just tell you something? He's not going to do anything in your life. 
The reason Brother Pichardo is what he is today, whatever he is today, he's a good man, is because there was a time when Brother Pichardo said, I'm giving myself to the Lord, I'm going to do what he says. You know, it's almost like, to me, and maybe this is Myersology, I'm not sure. To me, it's almost another decision we make after salvation, Brother Pineda. You see, if you look at the Old Testament, the picture of salvation is when the children of Israel went through the Red Sea. God parted it for them, right? All they had to do was go through. Jesus did everything for us to get saved. All we have to do is accept it. Now, what was God's will for them after they were saved? To get to the promised land. The place of God's blessing, the place of living by God's promises and doing everything he says. But you know what, Brother Pichardo? They had to make that decision to go into the promised land. And the first time they got there, they said no. And by the way, well, God parted, God parted the Jordan River for them to go across when they went across. But did he do it like he did the Red Sea? Nope. You know what he said? He said, I'm not parting until you stick your foot in. The first time they went, they said, I ain't sticking my foot in. He goes, guess what? We're going to have a death festival. All of you 18 years and over, or over 18 years, for 40 years, we're going to walk around in circles. You're all going to die. You want to die in the wilderness? You prayed about it? Fine. I'm going to answer that prayer. You don't want to live in the promised land? Go ahead. Die in the wilderness. He goes, now your children are going to live in it. 40 years later, children said, you know what? I'm in. And guess what? The priest stuck his foot in the water. God said, he parted it, and they went. Listen, there needs to come a time in our life. I got saved, and I mentioned many times, I didn't serve God for two years, but I remember when I made the decision I was going to do it. My brother took me to church on a Sunday morning, and I went four weeks in a row. He was in town. He took me to Gethsemane. We went, we went and after he, after he went back home, I said, I'm going to go. My mom and I, we would go, and I think my aunt came. We went for four Sundays. After four Sundays, it's like, I got to make a decision. Am I going to take this thing seriously, or am I just going to mess around? And I said, I am going to follow the Lord. I made a conscious decision. You know what I did? I said, Lord, I'm presenting myself to you. Now he says here, we're supposed to be a living sacrifice. You know, they used to present the animals on the altar and sacrifice them. It wasn't that hard. You know why? You killed them first. Once, once that animal was dead and up on the altar, he was going nowhere. It was over. But God says, you're not, a dead, you're not a dead sacrifice. I want a living sacrifice. You know what we do? We crawl up on that altar and we're like, woo, what a good place this altar is. And then the heat starts to come. It's like, woo, hey, oh, I didn't get a fire. I'm getting off the altar. How many times have we done that? Listen, we got to stay with it. But we got to say, Lord, I am here. I am presenting myself to you. I will follow what your word says. A living sacrifice. And then he says there's holy separation, wholly acceptable unto God. See, once we present ourselves, let's get ready for the change. You're never going to change until you do that. See, some of you say, man, I've been saved, and I haven't changed, and, and I don't know what's going on. Have you ever, have you ever presented yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm in? I know you saved me. I've given you my soul. Now you can have my life. See, most people are like this. Lord, you can have my soul, but leave me alone until I get to heaven. That doesn't work. By the way, that's not just a, that's not just a sinful decision. That's a bad decision. You ever see people, they made a bad business decision. Let me just tell you something. Not living for God on this earth, in my estimation, by the word of God, that's a bad business decision. Right? I think it's a bad decision. I'm doing my own thing. There is a way which seemeth right unto the man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Bad decision. Present your bodies. Now, we're afraid. Well, if I present myself to God, he's going to make me, he's going to make me a missionary to Siberia. He's going he's to want me to do something that's goofy and I won't want to do. Can I just tell you something? God's our heavenly father, is he not? How many of you have children? Do you look at your children and say, I'm going to give them the worst possible thing in the world to do. I hope that they're miserable. No. We want what's best for them. Do you understand that God knows each and every one of us better than we know ourselves? And God knows that exact thing that is best for you. But see, that's just what Satan throws out there. Holy, separated, that means sanctified, set apart for God's purpose. 
the best thing you could ever do is do what God wants you to do. And then he says this, and we're done. He says, which is your reasonable service. You know what that means? It just makes sense. It adds up. It's like a math equation. If I look and someone says 2 plus 2 is 4, it works. It makes sense. Right? It's like, I remember when Jessica was about, she was about 3, she was sitting on that, she was sitting in the living room and she had a calculator. I think she learned how to use a calculator. And I know what she was doing. She's like, she typed in something and then she goes, she goes, it works. She typed in 2 plus 2 is 4. Then she goes, 2 plus 2 1. It is 4. That's how God's will is. It adds up. It's reasonable. It makes sense. You know what doesn't make sense? Not following God. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for a child of God not to trust his father enough to follow his word. I love you. You're my father. Do this. I can't. But that's best for you can't do it. That doesn't make sense. And once we follow him, it's like, Lord, you were right all along. That does make sense. It is reasonable. God is not unreasonable with us. You know who's unreasonable? Satan's unreasonable. Our flesh is unreasonable. Because our flesh has no idea what is best. Let me ask you this morning, we're done. Are you following God's will? You say, and I don't know specifically what God has for me. I know what he does have for you. He has this book. Anything this book tells us to do, it's God's will. And if we follow that, I just have a sneaking suspicion we're going to get to where God wants us to go. It's a road map. We may not know the end, where it's going to lead us, but we're just following him daily by daily, just following his word, doing what he says. We're going to get exactly where he wants us to go. God's will, where is it? It's God's word. Let's stand this morning. Thank you for listening.